Hello and welcome to edition 11 of Audiovisual Cultures, the podcast exploring sound and image cultures in their many shapes, forms and varieties. I'm your host Paula Blair. This week Andrew Shiel and I reflect on our visit to the National Science and Media Museum in Bradford during the spring break in April 2018. A really big thank you to all our listeners, supporters, sharers and pledgers. To sustain and improve the podcast please consider giving a small monthly amount at patreon.com forward slash pea blair where you can get more information about my other work including videos blogs and publications all support is gratefully received and helps make robust arts and humanities education widely accessible enjoy the discussion and i'll be back to talk to you again for a little while after so oh, it's the spring break and we're joining you from Bradford this time. Yesterday we spent the afternoon in the Science and Media Museum. The National Science and Media Indeed. And what national even means is something that <laughs> is a bit up for debate, I think, in this context. So we'll maybe get on to that as well. We're just going to talk through a few of our experiences and what we did and some of the exhibitions and what we thought of them and stuff. Okay, so just to provide some shale historical nerd context, this was what was initially, from when it was set up in 1983, the National Museum of Photography, Film and Television. It was renamed in 2006 as the National Media Museum, and then it was renamed last year in 2017 as the National Science and Media Museum. I've been once before, you haven't been I've before? I've never been to Bradford yeah. before, so right. I'm having a great time. And when I went, it was shortly after it had become the National Media Museum. Even so, it was still in a set of galleries, one about film, one about photography, one about TV. It was relatively little exhibition space, and those exhibitions, I can see why they weren't deemed to be popularly attractive. Because clearly what's happened since is, mm. in, and part of this is the change to the National Science and Media Museum, is lots of interactive exhibits. The biggest one, I suppose, is the Wonder Lab, which mm-hmm. is the main thing you come to when you get above the temporary exhibitions uh-huh. on the first few floors. Everything there is interactive mm-hmm. in some way. And the whole point of, I think, the change to the National Science and Media Museum is that this museum is now a set of insights into the physics of perceiving media objects. Yeah. Optics so, and oral scapes, that kind of thing. They had ways of showing the oddities of the way that we see mm-hmm. colour. They had ways of illustrating how you change the wavelength mm-hmm. of a piece of sound, mm-hmm. for example. They had ways of illustrating how we perceive yeah. death. Highlight and colour works and delays when you're recording things yeah. visually or in audio and how frequencies affect whether or not we can even hear. The sound yeah. stuff was for two very visual people. The sound stuff we found quite intriguing, didn't we? Really, yeah, it was great. I mean, that was when we could get to it. (laughs) Oh yeah, because, yeah, the big thing we ought to name, elephant in the room, is so many kids. So many kids. Well, because it's the school holidays and it was fantastic. I mean, and they were all so excited and it was amazing to see them and uh, and it was so great to hear little voices going, oh, this is so cool, this is the best thing ever, you know, and really getting a lot out of it and learning and things like that. But unfortunately, a lot of the kids were incredibly entitled and were literally pushing us out of the way <laughs> I got shoved off literally shoved off things by children <laughs> all day there was a the variety of kids I was present at one very interesting interaction people watching is a whole other uh-huh. thing that you can do at museums like this I was present at one interaction which was a young and extremely confident girl probably about seven I think really well spoken as well. I don't mean well spoken in the sense of you know politely spoken just really confident uh-huh. And put together really coherent sentences, instructing these two boys who were slightly older than her how to do a thing, mm. and they would not just listen. Yeah, that was really intriguing. Really telling. And then there was a little kid who came and sat next to us when we were playing Prince of Persia on a Sega, I think it was. Yeah. No, oh no, that was no, something else. No, was it, 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 it was oh. a Nintendo oh. thing. It was one of the early Nintendo console games, I think. My next door neighbours, the boys who lived next door to me, had it, and I used to watch them playing it for hours on end, and I can't believe it because. Because that was so boring yesterday. Well, I, I mean, it was great fun with the kid there. <laughs> he made it come alive. It was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
his emotional reactions to everything that we were doing and all the he mistakes. He was really making. small yeah. as well. He must yeah. have been three, no older than four. That little boy. Yeah. Oh yeah. Gauging the ages of kids. This is our Difficult. our superhero weakness, isn't They're it? They're so grown it's, up so yeah. fast. Um, I would have said six. Really? But well, yeah. he seemed really small. Oh, physically, yeah. Um, he didn't yeah. have a huge vocabulary. Maybe five. I but don't know. His parent or guardian was. So funny because yeah. she was trying not to she tell him mortified. off, but was also mortified that he just kept grabbing the joystick off her wrist. He did, but he was just like, "I'll show you how to do it," <laughs> and then he didn't have the <laughs> to do, do anything. Well, to be fair, <laughs> I was probably the only one who'd actually played that game before. I had and, watched it being played, yeah. but I'd never used that controller before. Well, because when I played it, I played it on a PC, so it was all keys. Yeah, they, than the, my, uh, the friends I watched playing it, they had a different controller for it. They didn't have the one with a joystick, I don't think. I can't remember them having that. And then we played a bit of Sonic the Hedgehog. Oh, on I handed your arse to you on Sonic the Hedgehog. I never understood. <laughs> I'd never understood that one. Don't yeah. remember playing that one because it was races actually. It was mm. I was Sonic and you were Tails and we were trying to get to the end in the fastest time. Yeah. That doesn't imply I mean just the fact that I won a couple of them doesn't imply that we did it fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's all relative. Yeah. We've forgotten how to do all these things, forgot about all yeah. the spiky things <laughs> come out yeah. to kill you. A lot of stuff was coming back. <laughs> the arcade interestingly though, there was dwelling on the games gallery and it was hardly a, an exhibition about games, it was just a gallery in which people yeah. Yeah, it was just an yeah. arcade gallery. Just, yeah. Significant distinction. On the left, console stuff which you didn't have to pay for. Yeah. On the right, lots and lots of arcade games yeah. which you did have to pay for. It was 10, 20p, it was very little. But there's an income stream for the mm-hmm. museum right there. Definitely. It's a free museum, let's be frank. Yeah, These yeah. museums that have to get their money somewhere. Mm-hmm. And clearly the three major revenue streams that museums tend to draw on, which are... The gift shop, uh, the cafe. Yeah. And in this case, they are multiple screens, mm-hmm. including, I think, the first iMac in the UK they need as much as they can get so anything on top of that where they can get money which brings us on to the thing which we seem to have both enjoyed the most out I of think things. so yes yeah. now I'm going to say because it was three pounds for a ticket yes. for the virtual reality and you got eight minutes and I have to say I think that was a bit stingy I could have done 15 easy I was there going wow I got a ticket to do this really cool thing which involves quite a sophisticated virtual reality yeah, harness yeah. for three quid Woo! but then I didn't realise that it was going to be eight minutes eight minutes yeah. it was so cool I could have been in there for quite a bit longer actually it was fantastic it was called Thresholds it was a virtual reality exhibition created by a guy called Matt Collishaw it's a combination of a virtual reality headset headphones a backpack which seems to contain lots of things including power for everything that you've got on your head and also that seems to transmit your location to the central computer which is providing you with all yeah. of your visual information combination of all of that stuff with a room inside a room and this room was completely white if you actually looked at it without mm-hmm. the virtual reality yeah. headset on and it contained rudimentary mock-ups of the objects mm-hmm. that were in the virtual reality space mm-hmm. so that if you went and touched a table touch it, yeah. in the virtual reality space you'd feel a table in front uh-huh. of you. The room was probably only something like 20 feet by yeah, it wasn't 15 that big. feet. Yeah, there were letting a few yeah. people in at a time. It's important to explain what it is because mm-hmm. it's not simply that this National Science and Media Museum was hosting an exhibit it, which is about virtual reality uh-huh. and that we might consider virtual reality a form of medium mm-hmm. not simply that but that the virtual reality experience was a photography exhibition yes it was from yeah. 1839 uh-huh. and of course calling it a photography exhibition is slightly anachronistic mm-hmm. because at the time and it was an exhibition by William Henry Fox Talbot at the time he called them photogenic drawings mm. and I had a little tiny melt yeah. when I saw that because I had a little look at the book that Fox Talbot produced showing some of of his first few what we would call photographs and the name of the book was the pen of nature so his idea is that the technology he's come up with is simply something that permits light that gives light a pen instead of light writing itself down so photogenic Photo- drawings photography. is yeah, yeah. as it, photogenic is literally created by light that ultimately gives us photography but i quite like when we imagine photography now we imagine a set of basic Optical processes, very reliable technologies that were used to operate yeah, these processes. Yeah, it's technology heavy, no? Yeah, yeah, it's doing the grunt work. Therefore, that if there's a human, if there's a creative 
role mm-hmm. in it. It's mm-hmm. the human using that in certain ways, such as exploiting limited depth of field that comes with certain lenses, mm-hmm. for example. Whereas in Vox Talbot's time, his description of photography is of something which involves creativity anyway. Mm-hmm. It's just not human creativity. Yeah. It's the sun. The term sun pictures is coming back to me from photographic right. journals from the 1890s. Mm-hmm. It's the sun that, or just light itself, which is which has innate creativity. And of course it has this in the vocabulary of the time because it's doing something that up until that point humans have done. So I just love that conceptual aspect of early photography, including that it's not called photography. All right, and so I just looked up where this virtual reality mm-hmm. exhibition was set. It was an exhibition of photographs, something like 80 photographs, I think, mm-hmm. altogether, all them in cabinets. And these photographs were shown as part of an art exhibit at Somerset House, which is on the Strand in London. The building is now lots of different things. The Courtauld Institute uses part of it, King's College London uses part of it, lots of art institutions use lots of different parts of it, but way back in the 1830s when this happened, it seems that the Royal Academy was using it as well. So it was part of a larger exhibit of drawings and paintings. I like this idea that it starts off as part of something else. It starts off as a kind of kooky form of something that people are already Mm -hmm. doing, where it's the sun that's been given the authorship in this particular corner. And it was this room that was being recreated was a very small room and you saw a lot more of it than me. I don't know why though. Well I started to get a sense after a while that you got more time on your VR than I had. I don't know. Because when I finished I was watching you doing it. But yeah but time. I think it, you got in before me because yeah. it took a while to and then I was trying to because I had to see if I could get my glasses under the thing and it just took a bit longer I think for me to get all the kit on whereas yeah. you were straight in there. So, okay so, so it wasn't there because was, of that. It wasn't that. Was, I had to come in after you. I think maybe it was that I just instantly started getting obsessed with my own hands <laughs> before I went anywhere near actually looking at the yeah. photographs or having a look around the room because there was in addition to the photographs the room itself was fascinating it was yeah so the hands thing that so was amazing this, I was not aware that this mm-hmm. was possible now because on the front of our goggles there was a sensor uh-huh. which rudimentarily sensed what was very close up yeah. in front of our other faces other bodies and your own hands yeah other bodies moving around would appear like these sort of ghostly whitish blobs and I think those weren't being sensed by the sensors that were on the front of our goggles mm-hmm. it was just that everyone's backpack was transmitting a signal uh-huh. showing where they were within the room because there was an yeah. overview as well like there was a top down view of the room and you could see everybody moving around yeah and there was one point where I could see you and we were talking as well and that was the one non-VR part yeah. was that in addition to hearing stuff through you the hear, headphones yeah. you could also just hear each other talking there was one point where I saw a blob and I said hey Dr Blair is that you and you went yeah it is and, and we held hands for just a moment yeah. and then we went and we did some stuff apart from that there was no interacting with other people in the room uh-huh. in fact there was one point where I noticed that there was about five ghosts all bunched up in one corner yeah, they... and I thought I'm not going to go anywhere near uh-huh. that corner for the moment and then one of the attendants came in uh-huh. and said look you're all bunched in one corner you spread out a bit yeah and we're like we don't know where we are <laughs> but you could see each other I was yeah. uh, I think at that point I was in one of the corners but I was staring out the windows because you could they had windows with bars on them and you could hold onto the bars and I was craning around because you could look up at the sky it was night time and there was these really ominous clouds and there were people from olden day times walking around <laughs> there was a point where they told you to listen out if you hear lots of noise happening look out the windows and there was a riot happening which I don't think you saw I heard the noise and I thought oh yeah, I'll go and have a look at the windows and there was six them. windows and there was one person at every single window uh-huh. I could see a ghost at every single window so I thought I'll just wait and then it was over yeah you could see there was just this crowd of people running and yelling and there were pitchforks there was fire there there was drunk people lolling around and they were sort of chasing somebody so it was a bit of excitement but even before and after that there was just sort of the odd person milling around on the ground outside so Sandy it looked like details. you were up on like a second floor or something but it was so detailed inside as well but the hands it was really fascinating because you could see these blobs and then when you got side of these blobs you could hover over a photograph 
with your palm flat towards it and then you just turned your hand slowly and it, you could see the photograph close up. It was like you were able to reach, it would have been something you would not have been able to do in the exactly. original exhibit. You could Left magically it, pick it up and, yeah. pull a photograph out from a glass cabinet. You would not originally have been able to uh -huh. get at it and bring it up to your face. Yeah, you could see the <clears> details <throat> in them and they were really fascinating. For that alone, you needed more time because the room itself was so detailed. We were in quite a small box of a room, but the virtual reality room was huge. You were actually restricted. It was sort of blocked off as if it was cabinets yeah. to either side, but it extended well beyond that space and the roof was really tall as well. There was so many details so there were chandeliers with moths flying around. At one point I could see something, a really tiny black thing scuttling around the floor and I thought oh, maybe it's a mice but I couldn't see it close enough and I said out loud oh there's something running about on the floor how cool and one of the attendants said yes yeah, a little mice and if you look up at the chandeliers you'll see some moths and I looked up and before I could say oh wow or something like that this other woman just went oh that's disgusting <laughs> I thought oh come on this is really cool this is so detailed are people that used to a sanitised environment that just seeing some sort of non-human life uh -huh. inside a building is disgusting to it's, me I mean and it was just not even real moths it's just virtual reality moths and, and moths are not disgusting yeah. anyway <laughs> moths yeah it's not like it's snails sliming along the floor I mean those aren't particularly gross either <laughs> the spider that, that was, was so funny was crawling around on one of the portraits one on of the, the wall things. Yeah. yeah but that was the one where I think where you had said you were watching me through the window and I, I think that was the thing I was thinking that where one of the portraits was on the wall it was actually a window so you're staring at this painting <laughs> with a spider running up and down it and, um, and people are gawping it at you yeah. <laughs> there's several experiences there because the first is seeing these photographs uh -huh. which are well over a century and three quarters oh, well old well over yeah. yeah 1839 was it yeah and these are obviously from the museum's collections yeah lovely stuff and even the earliest of the photographs were not actually taken using a camera this is very cool stuff you know it's the naked version of the medium mm -hmm. right, before it, people figure out constraints to put it in Fox Talbot made these exposures by taking the object itself it was leaves ferns nice detailed mm -hmm. fern leaves and placing them onto the light sensitive paper and then exposing it to light and then covering it mm -hmm. up again and then fixing it somehow and so there was no using a camera to focus an image onto a screen through a lens none of that stuff it was just putting the thing you want to take a photo of right on it fascinating stuff so the first thing was getting to see these extraordinarily brittle mm -hmm. photographs in the collection the second thing was getting to see a virtual reality environment yeah. the third was experiencing this very particular sort of virtual reality technology because it was what you can see what you can hear a degree of interactivity yeah. and also your hands without having gloves on Right? Uh -huh, this, yes. is, this is the amazing bit. Your when you gloves yeah. on, you can do stuff with your hands as long as you're looking at them. Mm -hmm. There's the sensors on the front of the goggles. And then the fourth was when I'd finished, mm -hmm. <laughs> standing outside through the window watching mm -hmm. how other people, when they're in this immersive environment, look. Yeah. And you had a smile on your face oh, I was, that was impish. I was having a great time. Fascinated. It was the opposite of, uh, that's disgusting. You were going, this is the This is the coolest thing yeah, ever yeah. in my life. <laughs> I want to do it again. I want to do this every day. It was so great. There was a fire in the corner as well. So they had, I think, it must have been a heater or something emitting heat. So it was really sensory in that sense as well. But you could see and hear this crackling, roaring fire. And well, it was in the middle of this massive room, but it's in the corner in the space that you're in. Somerset House is lots of long galleries. Uh -huh. So I suppose we were in a little slice of a long gallery, effectively. Yeah, it was sort of like the middle section of a much bigger room and it was so detailed you know the ceiling was really detailed the floor was really detailed all the cabinets were so detailed and you know you could touch everything you reach out you could touch the cabinets so they were just painted white wood but you could feel all the different sort of corners and bumps and the bits that were glass you could touch them or bump your face against them <laughs> it's like I'm doing I'm just trying to look closely at them but the mask comes out so far and it's really difficult to have a yeah. perception of how far comes out there was little balls they had the chemicals for making up the stuff 
so I was looking at the labels on the bottles, I was trying to read them, but I was trying to get closer, yeah. and of course it was whacking my face off the thing, <laughs> and they're padded of course, so that was fine. <laughs> but I was really delighted that it would fit over my glasses. The person was saying that if you have really wide, thick frames, it's a bit difficult, but they fitted just perfectly over mine. Let's just pause for a moment, because at that moment, the image hitting your retina was going through the squishy lens uh-huh. inside your eye, the cornea, which is the lens on the surface of your eye, the lens of your <laughs> glasses, and it was originating from a screen that was about an inch and a half in front of your uh-huh. eyes. Okay. That is a lot of transparent surfaces being uh-huh. involved in you seeing something. I think you're seeing a lot with your hands in a way as well, if that makes sense, because you can mm. feel the objects in the room to a point it makes it feel real. So even if you can't see your hands wrapped around the bars, you know mm. that they're there and you can feel it, and it's almost as if they are there. You can't see them, but you know they're there because you can feel it. I'm thinking, for a small environment where you're supposed to be interacting with lots of things without really going very Uh far just creating the environment in white painted wood is feasible isn't it but for any bigger environment it would have to be that you'd create the sense of touch through having a complete skin covering suit wouldn't you which is the ready player one (laughs) it was an alternative route Mm -hmm. to touching something in virtual reality Mm -hmm. of course there's still a few senses left over that aren't getting the impression that you are in this virtual world and it's the smell taste sense I think that's where it can get really visceral mm. and get really immersed, is if you can smell yeah, things that are supposed to be there. Yeah, because if it had been that kind of musty yeah. smell, that probably would have heightened it even more if you could smell the fire. But just feeling the heat and hearing the crackles. That was just a lot, yeah. Seeing the light from it, you know, that was already quite a lot. It was as if you could smell it in a way, because mm. there's all these other senses are informing what it would be like. Ooh, what's it called? What? When you experience one sense impulse, and you because you associate it with another one, you hallucinate that other sense impulse. I don't know. It's not proprioception, that's something like else. A um, transference um, or something? I'm going to look that one up. Should we touch on some of the other things? Well, I, well just um, because I just wanted to think for a moment about the idea of virtual reality as giving you a gateway to time travel, because this was set up as if it was an exhibition from almost 180 years ago. This is very possible now, as if you have detailed documentation of something. And I suppose even today, I mean, we've got online exhibitions and things like that, but if the virtual reality can... If you're somebody who can't travel, say, Venice or New York or wherever a massive exhibition is, if you could access a virtual reality version, that would be incredible. Media that we see as... A lot less immersive than this have been touted in their time as providing an opportunity mm-hmm. for people who don't have the means or ability to travel to just do it anyway. Yeah. So this is one of the dominant discourses in the late 1900s yeah. and early 1910s about cinema. As technology advances and becomes more accessible, then it makes it more possible that it's more widely accessible to a wider range of people. If you're somebody who can't afford the hundreds of pounds to go to another country to see a major exhibition that's happening that you really really wants the same but you can't afford you know a fiver to see a virtual reality version for 20 minutes or whatever it is in 30 years time then that could really begin to democratize who gets to access these things Going from that exhibition, one of the very first ever photographic exhibitions, to thinking about the photography exhibition that's in the museum at the moment, it's called City Girls, and it's a solo exhibition of photographs taken by Nutrat Afsa. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that properly. There's quite a lot of information on the museum's website. So it's called City Girls, and it's about the women who go to see Bradford. United, Bradford just City. Bradford City, I don't yeah. know. I just kept seeing headlines for United everywhere, mm. so I was getting really confused about <laughs> even though I should know it's Bradford City. Uh, but going to see Bradford playing football, I had some issues with it. So I want to say from the top, I mean, this is somebody who, I looked at the exhibition first, and then I read the information about it afterwards. And I was going around the exhibition, and I could see this person isn't trained, this person is using a really good camera and is setting up really a lot of the photographs are really well framed and they know what they're looking at and stuff but this is someone with a really good quality camera pointing and shooting on match days and that's fine but I was going around I was thinking well (laughs) 
this is fine but I don't really care because it's football and it doesn't actually matter. There were a lot of quite intensive images of people's faces with concern, with worry. They were immersed in the game, they had no awareness of the camera on their face, that kind of thing. Some of those were really very well taken but because of what the subject matter was I couldn't muster up any emotion about it at all because I've seen so many photographs taken by professionals who are technically trained in war zones with people with very similar looks on their faces and they really have something to worry about so I, I find it very difficult to really care about the exhibition and then I think also because it was sort of I think presented a bit as oh isn't this a great feminist thing all these women who also enjoy football and look at the range and the diversity of them but I just kept thinking all of these women why do you not have anything better to do with your time than watching 20 odd grown men specifically exclusively men running about after a ball that's not a feminist act <laughs> I did look up Bradford City Women's Football Club yeah but it wasn't anything to do with them and they weren't watching the Bradford City Women's no, Football Club no they're watching the men that's the thing it's yeah. exclusively the men's team that's a whole other thing about well it's a homosocial environment so yes it is important to point out that women love this as well but it's a very male homosocial environment but also it's a very pervasively heteronormative one as well because even still to be gay and mainstream football is a very difficult to be thing in 2018 which is really disappointing so I couldn't really get behind any of that at all. I just looked up Nudra Afsa's bio on a website called notjusthockney.info Born in 1905 in Rawalpindi in Pakistan Nudra Afsa is a self photographer who lives in Well I'm Bradford. getting I'm getting on to that. When I was reading all of that, her bio and when I was reading the exhibition text after looking at the photographs, this is an exhibition that was funded by the Arts Council of England. I think it's amazing that they put so much support behind someone who actually is amateur and I'm saying amateur in the true sense that this person is not a professional, is not professionally trained, but is still a really good photographer. I think my issue is that just yesterday I was reading about the other day the Arts Council of Northern Ireland which has had its own funding cut significantly over the last number of years and in turn is making significant cuts to the arts in Northern Ireland and two really important studio and gallery spaces have entirely lost their funding this year in Belfast and I'm absolutely gutted about that PS2 and Queen Street Studios are part of the very important lifeblood of the arts in Belfast. It's just seeing the difference. That's what I'm angry about. It's amazing that in England the Arts Council will support somebody from AFSA's background and ability. In Northern Ireland there's no money to support people who are professionally trained and incredibly hardworking and art is their life. They're everything. They're not self-taught. They've done several degrees and they're working at it all the time and it's not to say that an amateur isn't doing the same on their own time of course they are I'm not trying to devalue amateur work I'm saying that this is the discrepancy between the arts councils across the UK and that's the thing that bothers and upsets me a bit about that but even within the museum itself it's really fascinating to have this virtual exhibition of probably the first ever photographer in a sense and this is somebody who is a scientist I think he counts as the first ever photographer in the UK. Uh-huh. One of these instances yeah, where there's multiple people in different countries developing yeah. the same thing through different methods at the same time. So. so one of the earliest, what we would now refer to as a photographer, and somebody who's doing scientific experimentation and making art with that, to someone who is using a device from a very long well, relatively short, but also a long evolution in this science, where the technology does everything for you. You can choose, well I want these in black and white because I'd like them to look profound and I'm going to have these different focal ranges within one image because the camera can do all that for me. Again it's that idea of beginning of democratising who can access the equipment to make these images. So I think those side by side is really fascinating within the museum. Just 
I'm having a look on the National Science and Media Museum's website, and we didn't see either the Kodak Gallery, which is a permanent no. exhibition of the history of photography, mm. or the Animation Gallery, which is a permanent history of animation. And we also missed, just by five minutes, the Age of Animation yeah. show. So, well, because we, we were in a very important meeting with this young person who was showing us how to play Prince of Persia, and we couldn't get away. But we did a lot of it. Well, I suppose it's reasons to try and come back at some other point. We did see the television stuff. We saw quite a bit of the television exhibition and I had quite a mixed response to that as well. I mean, that was one of the points where I was questioning, well, what does it mean by national museum here? Because from what I could see, it was all English and American. So is it national in terms of this is where the UK's stuff is all housed? Or is it national in terms of this is England's stuff? Is it England as nation rather than UK? Is the American obvious? Obviously, is because we're so infused with dominant American culture. I was sort of thinking through those sorts of things. I suppose it's like the British Museum. Everything's appropriated from elsewhere and it's about colonisation more than anything else. But it was exclusively English and I found that disappointing that there was no... Basically, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland didn't exist in this museum. In that museum, it's called the National Museum. I feel like in other museums of a similar kind that wouldn't call themselves national, you've got a bit more of a representation of everybody because we're all here you know we all mix I mean I live in England so we all mix we all move around I feel a bit disappointed that there was nothing from anywhere else I say we go and see these last two exhibitions and if there isn't any registering of the role of Wales, Northern Ireland and Scotland and for a brief period of time or well, quite a long period of time all of Ireland then yeah that would be notable I suppose I mean specifically in the television stuff because I was thinking about the television exhibition maybe there is in the photography I don't know but from what we saw it was either very general or it was specific to England I think when we say national television and national news those are the things that everybody's getting it's not the regional stuff I think that was where I thought well England needs to, uh, yes England has many regions but what about the rest of us who are regions but also nations it's a very messy identity thing that's going on in the United Kingdom If you ask anyone at the moment what do they mean by nation or national uh-huh. When they use those words, yeah. if you get down to it, the honest answer is I don't know. Yeah, yeah. How it's, are you using it? Yeah. I suppose I was questioning a bit there, but yeah, it was more dominant stuff. I think when we sat in the, there was a part where there was notable television moments. There was a screening of specific clips of things that seemed to be mostly twentieth century. There, I don't remember seeing anything apart from nine eleven. There wasn't really twenty first century stuff. Nine eleven was the most recent one, I think. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. It went from the coronation of Elizabeth II up to 1911. Which was 1953 up to 2001. And then the things in between, it was stuff like... Well, on the football theme again, and what really annoys what continues to annoy me, is the 1966 England and World Cup win in the football. I was playing, and I couldn't stop myself, and I shut up afterwards, because there was a person with, I think, her own small children, and they were asking her, you know, all the questions with every clip that came on. She was explaining all that, that was England when they won the World Cup. And I said, yeah, and I haven't shut up about it since. <laughs> I don't think that went down very well. So I shut up after that. It's been over 50 years and they haven't won anything since. Stop harping on about it. It's not a great television moment. It's a thing that happened one time, a very long time ago. How many teams have and will win the World Cup? It annoys me because I keep seeing that being represented as as this great moment of British historical significance. And again, I see nothing of my people, of my culture, or even of Scottish or Welsh or any regional English stuff. There was nothing about the minor strikes. There was nothing about the conflict in Northern Ireland. We just had the 20th anniversary of the signing of the Good Friday Agreement. There was nothing in this range of clips about a 30 year conflict in this country which is shocking to me I think is a real oversight and actually speaks volumes to me and yet it pretty much ends doesn't it the loop ends on the planes hitting the twin towers and I find I mean I, there was quite a lot of the stuff I found very difficult to watch but that I was really nearly in tears that was the most of the footage I'd ever seen I think because yeah. I deliberately didn't look 
I was a teenager when it happened. I think I was 16, yeah, about to turn 17. And this is an event I didn't have a huge amount of awareness of until afterwards because in that same week we found out that my grandmother had cancer and she never left the hospital. So that the family was consumed by our own little family tragedy that was happening, which of course was huge to us. It was really only afterwards that I realised the extent of what had happened with the attack. It's something that in terms of images has very much set the tone for the 21st century really I think in terms of image culture and virality and but I remember deliberately not really watching too much of the footage because I felt like it would be like watching the Titanic sink. It felt disrespectful in a way to just gawp at this awful stuff that was happening. I kept thinking actually back to when we went to the Imperial War Museum North in Salford because they have certainly at the time anyway, they had a section of the mangled wreckage from one of the towers. Yeah. I remember standing in front of this huge fragment of what was a huge building and how mangled it was. This massive, I don't even know what they're called, but this mm. huge thing that looks unbendable was mangled and chewed up from this wreckage and I remember standing before it and feeling quite nauseous actually feeling quite sick because of what it came from and the destruction around it and the loss of life and everything the violence of it that was what was coming back to me when I saw the footage was actually the more visceral thing I had the kind of opposite interaction with the original TV coverage in that I was one of those people who was just stuck to a TV Mm. for about eight hours And afterwards when the BBC announced that that constant replaying of all the footage they had that they'd done Mm. over like wall-to-wall news for the rest of the day, that it was wrong. Sitting in um, in that room at the museum yesterday, the kids who were with us, Okay, they were watching things like when Tony Blair was Yeah, Tony elected Blair, PM. when Thatcher, yeah. her and inaugural it, speech, that kind of stuff. And they were asking their mum to tell them about stuff and she yeah. was explaining. And then there was the Challenger disaster. Yeah. And then there was 9-11. And then there was the Israeli embassy The Iranian, the Iranian embassy Iranian. in 1980. And in every instance, that was an image of people dying. Some of the aftermath of the Iranian embassy siege included somebody being carried out in a stretcher. And the kids were saying, what's that, what's that, what's that? She was being honest. She was saying, that's yeah, someone who's been injured. Somebody's been hurt. Um, yeah, They're people died when them. that happened. But I can understand why, after a bit, they just left. It was a bit much, but it was more, I think, the kids were getting sleepy. <laughs> Put kids in a dark and dreamy flashing lights. Because they'd been there from before us and we got through the whole loop, so they'd seen the whole thing, actually. Oh, wasn't there? It was some kids that came in afterwards who left quite quickly. Yeah, it was the other ones. They thought it was a bit boring because it was all news, oldie-timey looking yeah. stuff. It was stuff like that. So you would have the coronation, Princess Diana and Prince Charles' wedding, and Princess Diana's funeral. Yeah. There was a lot of frivolous sport, then really excessive tragedy. And I suppose in that I include Margaret Thatcher. Blimey, I would include, under the category of expressive tragedy, Diana and Charles getting married. Because that was very it, sad, it actually. Was, it was like this, this massive institution grabbed this young woman who did not have a clue yeah. and started to chew her up, but did so in a very kind of pretty and blingy way at the start so that it wouldn't be apparent that it was going to chew her up. As it said at the time, I think her having done that, it meant that her youngest son could marry an American person of colour and it not be a scandal or a massive big deal in 2018. The, even the particular act of her having married Charles or the particular act Well, it's of... all part of the progression, isn't it? It's the marriage, but then it's also what's happened since and the affairs they all had. It's sort of paving the way for the next generations to actually be honest about things and for the monarchy to change. Everything that came to light after she died, what it indicated was these people were being stifled, they were being suffocated by the mm-hmm. royal expectations being placed upon them. In some cases, not really even placed upon them by the public, just placed upon them by the weight of the institution. Yeah. And what that was doing to these people psychologically was obviously hideous. So now, for us to even contemplate the idea that if you don't want to be with somebody, the fact that you've married them means you have to stay with them, that just seems absurd. And so now, yeah, to be... You know, her sons have married relatively late compared to all of them, yeah. and they've actually had girlfriends before they've chosen the person they 
I really want to marry. It's an indicator of change. I think it's fair to say we'd both probably be on the more Republican side of stuff yeah. here. It's nice to see it changing. Let's clarify Republican though in this context because... Obviously yeah. it's not the Republican sort where I come from. It's Republican in the sense of you'd prefer a Republic rather than a monarchy. In any nation. State. Yeah, but who needs borders? Get rid of yeah. all the borders. Anyway. We didn't go and see anything in any of the screens at the National Science and Media Museum. No. So we may take the opportunity to do that today. Yeah. So there may be a part two yeah. of this one. There was quite a lot of stuff I really wanted to play around with. I don't know how much you looked at it, but on the way into the thresholds part, there was a really nice little exhibition about 3D vision and cinema Cine- cinerama. Yes. And the Brian May stuff, because he was really into, what was it, is it stereoscoping? Yeah, using a viewer which has got two lenses in it and a mount to put a double, a pair of photographs yeah. in when you put it all together and put mm-hmm. it in front of your face to create a three-dimensional image uh-huh. of a still photograph. Uh, I did not know this about yeah, the Brian yeah. May. And he's um, done whole books, he's co-written whole books that are using this equipment. And he's got a doctorate as well, I didn't know that either. He finished it a few years ago. And yeah, I did. In but general, Blair, did I you're not a lot mention more, this a few? Okay, yeah, okay, two things. Because we were talking about the other... T- when we were talking about Professor Brian Cox, I was sure I'd mentioned about Brian May also. I thought <laughs> I'd made you aware at least. Two things I have to point out. First, this is Dr. You, Brian. Yeah, you are generally more informed than me. And second, <laughs> I've got a bit of an awful memory. So <laughs> I do attempt to remember every detail of everything you told me, but sometimes in one ear. I think you're just um, not listening. <laughs> so I thought that was quite cool, but I really wanted to see the books. But of course there was a tribe of kids and I was about that one tribe of kids left and ran off. I took half a step before the next lot just raced ahead of me and started playing with these books. They weren't even looking at them properly. Youth really is wasted on the young, I think. There was lots of instances of different types of interactions between parents and kids going on uh, around there, but there was this one place where there was some serious conflict. It was awful. Between this 11, 12-ish yeah. year old kid who was probably autistic and his dad and the kid just did not want to be there anymore and the kids sibling they were two kids were squabbling they were serious everyone just needs to decompress and go somewhere else mm. happening there and you know these are great places to go and kids and adults generally love them but when you've got to that point where everyone's that strung out it is time just to leave yeah there was a family with a woman who was in a, a motorised wheelchair mm. and any time we saw her, one of her kids one of her not that young kids yeah. was draped over her lap getting a ride around the museum on this thing instead of using their functioning legs and one of them really quite vehemently shouted at his father for not letting him be the next one getting a wee ride round the fellow was even saying this is abuse the child was yelling that it was abusive Mm. Yeah. But, I think um, we need a very clear definition of abuse so, in popular consciousness. I now. just thought, I, if I was your parent, I'd be telling you, <laughs> I'd give you reason to be in a wheelchair if you keep talking to me like that. You would put someone in a wheelchair just by saying that. I just thought it was awful. Like it, Anyway, anyway, but it was stuff like that wasn't pleasant, I have to mm. say. That, I mean, you can't blame a museum for its patrons. But We must acknowledge that if it's a free museum, the way that any free museum functions is by appealing to families with young kids who are going to be buying stuff in the gift shop, using the cafe, putting money into things like the arcade games. That's an income stream. The, the venue courts that and relies on that. It's part of the obstacle course of going to I such mean, a museum. It's awful to think that, because it's free and accessible to anyone, that lots of badly behaved people will come. I find the behaviour really shocking. But then I'm thinking back to the day I spent with your children in the Centre for Life in Newcastle in the February half term. That was hiving with kids. I mean, I would say that was busier that day than the museum yesterday was but I didn't once see a kid being rude that mm-hmm. day I saw them all cooperating and being they were excited and yes we were running into each other but it wasn't in a I, I think you'll find this is my nice sort of way that it was yesterday it was oh isn't this great and they were all excited they would stop and show each other how to do things and they would cooperate with each other these are relatively comparable institutions one is a science museum and one is a science and media museum Centre for Life as well, but it's, it costs a small fortune to get into. I 
really wouldn't, I would like to have thought that that wouldn't have made a difference and I mean certainly any free museum I've ever been to and I go to many, I mean that was just shocking behaviour, I've never seen the like of it, you know to the extent of this all yesterday, yeah, you would see the odd thing and that's normal, but this was consistent the whole time we were there every kid we encountered almost was rude, every kid from whatever background, whatever colour whatever ability, whatever religious background, everything, every single child yesterday was rude what about that one kid who we were, we were playing oh, the Sonic oh girl yeah and yeah. I, I said I'm doing awfully at this and I gave my control uh-huh. to this girl and you and she played against each we other played, for about we, 10 seconds yeah <laughs> but then I think we both quickly died yeah. and I was like I'm leaving you to a kid <laughs> um, there's one kid maybe this is a revealing comparison between the northwest and the northeast it's possible but again I would really like to think not this is very narrow data that we've collected yeah. so bigger song <laughs> really bigger I don't want to collect more songs <laughs> <laughs> yeah you need to spend the next three weeks testing this hypothesis <laughs> that much time spent around kids well anyway there was some really cool stuff in the wonder lab though we had a look around first but it was really really busy and then when we got back because we wanted to see if we could get into the film but we'd missed the start of it and I think there was yeah. no late access but that meant that the wonder lab was quieter so we actually got looking at some stuff properly and it was really cool but then they all started to come back out again and we got nudged off stuff we produced a respectable photograph of the aftermath well, of you a... did mm, yeah. you did that was all you the aftermath of a drop of water hitting the surface of a still that's beautiful uh, pool the thing with that was just you get to vary the number of milliseconds between uh-huh, the when delay. the drop falls and when the photo is taken mm. by this fixed camera. I'm quite fascinated with sights that occur too briefly for our yeah. sensory array to perceive. But the technology they, allows you to, yeah. it makes it visible. These are sights that occur beneath our thresholds of perception. One of the things is when you, we see it all the time, when we see slow motion images of drops of water hitting something, it doesn't do, it doesn't create ripples, it creates a kind of little mini volcano, mm, yeah. which, ha, which has an undulating rim, and then if it's intense enough, that undulating rim will each separate out into lots of tiny little drops, uh-huh. which will hang in the air for a moment, and then they'll plonk down into yeah. the water. And you don't see that. That no. happens way too quickly to be perceived mm-hmm. by our sensory array. I'm quite obsessed with the fact that photography can see this. Photography can, by being able to take a piece of time which is far too brief for us to perceive it as a distinct event. Photography is able to do this. And the fact that it then presents that, it presents a sight that we would never ordinarily mm-hmm. see. We also tend, by looking at it for five seconds, ten seconds, a minute even, we see things that we're seeing all the time. And we're seeing them as if they last for a lot longer than they actually do and this is the thing that tabloid press are obsessed with because if they manage to get a photograph of somebody they're just talking right and they blink while they talk and so if you have lots of photographs of them just it's just a still photograph of someone talking but one of them is someone with their eyes closed mm-hmm. and their mouth open looking like they're drunk mm-hmm. looking obscene or even something... that half yeah. flutter <laughs> of their yeah. eyelids it's like you're seeing someone fainting of course people are doing this all the time mm-hmm. anyway yeah. we're watching people do this we're just not seeing people mm-hmm. do it you get that in a still photo slap that on the cover of a tabloid newspaper and it makes it look like a person who was just talking or in the case of your man Miliband just eating a bacon sandwich Mm. it makes it look like they don't know how to talk they don't know how to eat a bacon sandwich they don't know how to remain conscious and that basic deception that tabloids love to do it's something that we should all be media literate enough to go oh that's clearly not an image of something that somebody did for any more than a twentieth of a second it doesn't indicate that they don't know how to eat a bacon sandwich. Mm. Overlook it. And yet, as a rule, the majority of people... OK, maybe that's not correct, mm. but a vast number of people in this country, when they see images like that, don't go, that's a function of the yeah, it's technology. Just, it's an interim moment. So awareness of the consequences of using specific technologies mm-hmm. is not high enough amongst the general population. Yeah, but I think having an exhibition like that where they can actually take that photograph they can take those that range actually of, of images yeah. you would hope that that would communicate to somebody oh yeah. right there's all this stuff that we can't perceive so here is a function yeah. for one specific aspect of this museum and of course everything that we're learning about here has some sort of equivalent function even if yeah. it's one we can't
can't anticipate. One of them was varying how long a tube is into which you shout uh-huh. to vary how intense the, the echo. echo is. Being able to understand that a building isn't haunted, that mm-hmm. there's just a particular acoustic arrangement that means that echoes hang around for quite a long time. Yeah. There's a helpful piece of knowledge. They had a, a hall of mirrors, a short hall of mirrors. Of course, there were so many children running through it back and forth, bumping into the mirrors that you could actually easily tell where the mirrors are because they were covered in dirty marks. So you could tell the difference between, oh, this bit's clean, so this is obviously well, air. And not. I tend to get through halls of mirrors by looking at the ground. So you um, can see the difference in the reflection. Also, somebody's discarded package for what used to be Cadbury's mini eggs. <laughs> <laughs> was a bit of a tail in one of the corners. To be fair, the big large print sign... Other eggs are in, available. Yeah, the big large print sign that you read on the way into that hall of mirrors said, walk slowly with your hands out in front of you. Patrons are being informed. They should make greasy hand marks. We, we, the kids, of course, are darting in and out through it like nobody's business. Now, signage for everything that patrons yes, were being invited to interact with. that was great. With. Really uh, diverse. There was quite a deliberate decision of, I'm going to show the human in the yeah. drawing interacting with this thing as a... See, the term diverse as an adjective that does apply to some people and doesn't is bollocks. Mm. It's the total set. It's has the whole it, has spectrum a more of or less quality of diversity. And so, collectively, diverse portrayal uh-huh. of humans, in each case, the portrayal of the human interacting with the object was not necessarily a white man. Yeah. That was, I suppose, the... It was a range of ages, of colours, of abilities. One of them was an old person with a guide dog. There was one with an old person in a wheelchair. There were people wearing turbans. There were people wearing hijabs. There were kids. There were old people, adults people dressed in all manner of ways and all different shades that you can possibly be as a human being. It was just really nice actually, it was something that we noted as we were walking around and I just, it felt really refreshing. What you do do when you do that is you start to establish a register of types of humans which you recognise and so even with such a big range there's still types of humans which you haven't acknowledged exist and so my preference for doing something like that would just be to use stick figures rather yeah, than yeah. specific but types. But then you've got skinny privilege if it's stick people because at least in this it was people actually I think they were all fairly slim bodied people as well so you've still got a bit of skinny privilege there but not supermodel size which was also nice stick figures I would agree but skinny privilege I don't know, I had quite a good time at some of them. There were ones where actually you could feel sound as well. Like there was, I don't know if you did the one with the vibration from the floor. I was going to apologise actually. I called you away from that one to ask you to do another thing to do with sound. So no, I didn't do that one. Anyway, tell well, me I had it. been on that for a while, but also that was the second time I was on it because the first time a small child pushed me <laughs> off and then almost immediately left again after pushing me off the panel. So there was just this panel on the floor and it had four different types of music. And it was rock, jazz, bangra, and classical. You would choose one and it would play in the speakers. And the speakers were actually underneath your feet, under this panel underneath. They had little speakers at the side so you, you could hear it properly as well. They had the bass speakers underneath because they were trying to see how much bass you could feel. And mm-hmm. of course the rock one was taking me back to all the gigs I used to go to when I was younger and a bit more sprightly. You could feel it coming up. It was interesting to judge how far up your legs actually you could feel the vibration come. You were playing with the vibration in the water quite a bit. The changing the frequency and seeing how much the water would create the wavelengths. I I didn't understand the science of that well enough and I will look into it more because it was a long tube which was half full of water laid horizontally so along its entire length it was half full of water and then at one end there was a diagonal join to that tube and at the top of that diagonal stretch there was a big speaker and so what you did is by varying both volume and frequency you could fill that Mm -hmm. tube with the water in it with a lot of vibrating air and you could if the frequency was sufficiently high no matter what the volume was you could not make any sort of undulations in the water but the lower you got the frequency the more likely you were to be able to put some very regular looking vibrations into the water. I couldn't understand why that was happening. Mm. It was obviously to do with compressing the air, but was it also to do with compressing the water, for mm. example? Because I gather that water is nowhere near as compressible as yeah. air. Yeah, but it was yeah. interesting because it was quite a long tube and this was only at one end, so it would be quite a big reaction at one end and it'd be interesting to see how far along the water it would go yeah. before it petered out. Yeah. And it would create bubbles in the water and they would travel and bubble along the top of it for a while and it's made some really nice shapes. 
Well, one thing that I was quite fascinated with was there was a room with lots of text outside it about how if you shine coloured lights onto coloured surfaces, you can make those surfaces look very different from the colour mm-hmm. that they actually are. Mm-hmm. And there were these big paintings of parrots mm-hmm. on the wall, and the lights in the room were constantly changing from one colour to another, and they were never just white light. And the question above the parrots was, what colour are the parrots? Yeah. And the answer is, I don't know. You don't know because they would be red or blue or green. And they had, I don't know if you saw in it, because they had the very first colour photograph film was of a red macaw. And they explained a little bit how they managed to do that because it was using red lights to bring out the red of the feathers. I only got a wee minute in that room and the UV room as well because any time I went into either of them, it just crowded with massive families and prams. We did rock up at this museum at lunchtime, had lunch and then went to see yeah. exhibits and so we were seeing exhibits at about two. Yeah. Now it's ten o'clock in the morning the next day. Yeah. Now, now would be the ideal time to go and see it. We've got other museums to see as well okay. before we leave and go to Wales. We're going to kind of do non-mediatised things in Wales. Well it's got a really excellent website where you can actually see quite a lot of the collections and that's at www.science.com and mediamuseum.org.uk It's a really lovely well laid out website with all the information about everything that we've talked about as well if you wanted to check it out. Quite a lot of those exhibitions are on for a good part of the rest of 2018. Some of them are on to well into summer, some of them are permanent some of them are temporary things that will change but it's worth checking out what they've got. Having been to a much sparser previous incarnation of this museum I must say I'm impressed at what it has become now. Yeah it was really fab. Hopefully the games one will be on for a while if you wanted to recreate part of your childhood. In the case of the head, all the old consoles including the handheld ones like the original Game Boy, the old grey brick of a thing. We had one of those when I was young. The Sega Mega Drive, the N64 and the arcades were brilliant but we didn't really get a go on any of them. Worth checking out maybe at a time when it's not a school holiday <laughs> if you actually want to see stuff. In general get a job which means that you go on breaks at times that aren't school holidays. Yeah. That's today's take home message. Kids are great and all that. But kids are great but, but <laughs> the ones that we encountered yesterday were not those great kids unfortunately. <laughs> they, were, they were the very very rare exceptions to the rule basically. Yeah. Thanks very much for listening and I hope that discussion was useful. I do really recommend checking out the museum if you ever find yourself in Bradford. I've been reflecting as I've been listening and editing this episode. I feel like I've come across as probably a bit negative and certainly that's not the intention. And I think it was just we ended up, as you could probably tell, we had quite a stressful time because I still can't get over the volume of really rude uh, people and children we have happen to encounter and I would like to hope that that's not typical uh, of this museum but it's probably the worst I've ever experienced in any museum. Regardless of that there were some discussions I was a bit worried that I was coming across as maybe too harsh about the photography. I thought really hard about it and I thought well I'm gonna leave in a lot of what I've said because I've reflected on it and it's the role of a critic and an analyst to go well actually I don't actually think this works is that good and it's not personal to an artist and while I'm genuinely very pleased that this person's got the opportunity to be funded by the Arts Council of England I mean that's a really fantastic achievement and it's great to see what can happen when people get goes at stuff and I think my frustration is as I tried to convey that there's such a huge discrepancy between what the Arts Council of England is prepared to support and the utter lack of support that's happening in Northern Ireland right now unless you're the Ulster Orchestra or the MAC. More representation across the board is certainly needed and worth fighting for and that doesn't mean that anybody else has to lose out. That's the important thing to stress. So I think there's bigger issues around art funding and art value that are worth probing into in greater detail. So I think I'm going to try to seek out appropriate people to get on the podcast and speak about that sort of thing because it's something that I think is really important to deal with and to discuss but I don't feel terribly knowledgeable about art finance and business and the market and that sort of thing it's something I'm learning about I don't feel like I have the authority to really get into it by myself 
if I come across as a bit snippy in my review, my response to the photographs, it's because, well, those were the things that I was getting from the photographs and how they were produced. That's from me being somebody who's studied photography pretty extensively, has a PhD in film and visual culture and has spent many years learning and teaching film aesthetics. Just to say that I'm not being snippy, that's what I can see from the images, that those were the decision making processes at play there. Just to say as well that even if I find a topic to be fairly frivolous, I absolutely do think that there should always be space for the frivolous. I think it's just a matter of taste and exhibitions about people watching football matches is not to my taste but it will be to the taste of other people and certainly locals who are big football fans and supporters of their local team and who am I to take that away from them. I am aware of all those issues and I think there's probably a whole other discussion to be had as well about audiences and consumers of culture. I'm a big listener of Wittertainment, the Mark Carmode and Simon Mayo film review show and very frequently there are discussions about audience behaviours in the cinema. Something I feel very strongly about is other people's performances, behaviours in the cinema and being mindful of other people's experience, especially when they have had to pay money for something. But I think even regardless of that, this was a museum that was free to enter and it was free to see most of the exhibitions. But that shouldn't mean that that children get to touch me, to push me out of the way. And it shouldn't mean that we have to tolerate really awful, rude behaviour. I think there's an issue around sonic space as well. As I described, there was children shouting to the point where they were red in the face at their parents. Possibly this is a wider parenting thing. And who am I, again, to have an opinion on that? I am not a parent. It's probably, again, related to a larger issue around consent and shared spaces, respect and consideration while in shared spaces. Culture should be for everyone and it should be a shared experience and at the same time we shouldn't be silencing each other either. It's just basic respect and manners so there's bigger discussions to have around those kinds of things. The idea of having to share space while not preventing other people from engaging in something. I don't know if there's a general sense of entitlement that children have that everything is for and about them and no one else can use something and that you don't have to wait your turn you can just go and push an adult off something I was being physically touched and pushed by these other human beings but because they're young human beings they're not legal adults I feel like I can't say anything to them so I think there's probably more to tease out there with those issues So I just wanted to be clear that I'm aware of those things and I do worry about how some of the things we say come across. I just hope we're pitching it right but I also know that we can't always get everything right and everybody's constantly learning and constantly improving. We also have to stand by our responses to things too. If you're still listening, thanks so much for letting me say my piece and clarifying a few things. I'll leave you with the original ending I recorded for this podcast. I hope you find the discussion really useful and interesting and do check out the Science and Media Museum's website. It's really thorough and you can see lots of stuff from their archives on there and updated information about what the current exhibitions are in the future. A reminder that we're trying to make this fairly broad and we're really trying to get guests on. And if you're out there listening and you're working on something and you're really interested in a particular aspect of something that could be considered as audio and or visual culture, please get in touch via Twitter. You can find me at PEA Blair and also you can email audiovisualcultures, that's all one word, all lowercase, at gmail.com and that's until we get a proper website and a proper domain and things like that organised. So any money that's received via Patreon or donated on paypal.me forward slash PEA Blair, all of that's going towards improving my equipment and getting the resources I need online to be able to put the podcast on iTunes and more accessible websites for you. I've already got a link to an RSS feed on Acast. I'm not sure of how that's working 
looking out for any of you but do let me know and if you're out there and you're listening and you're feeling like I'm pretty inept at all this stuff that's probably true and give me a shout if you know any better that would be so much appreciated if there's any other ways of getting things out there without having to spend the money until then if you go to my patreon page you'll see my funding goals and the things that I'm aiming to save up to do to sustain the podcast I work freelance so I don't have a regular income and I'm trying really hard to make a range of educational resources from my teaching materials the podcast has taken up a lot of time because I'm pretty pernickety about editing it quite a lot I'm editing out all the annoying ums and silences and repetitions and things as much as I can to try and make a smoother listening experience I might give you a raw file at some point just to show you how much I actually edit out any financial support would be gratefully received because I'm trying to make videos and screencasts and trying to work on more publications as well for broader audiences than niche academic audience that I've been writing for before. I'm really passionate about broadening education and and I feel very strongly everybody should have access to all kinds of education so that's what I'm attempting to do while I've got the means and the more means I get from crowdfunding the longer I can keep going. Anyway enough about that. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks for getting to the end if you have. It's been great to find some really nice comments on Twitter from former students and colleagues who've given it a go and it's a slow burn we're starting off very small but I hope that this will build a really nice community thanks for sticking with me if you're new to this very welcome I hope you do stick with us and we'll chat to you next time